Nobody has joined. We will wait for uh, maybe five minutes, four or five minutes, then <coughs> I'll start a recording.
Thank you, Prashant, for joining. Nobody else has joined. I will start with you after one minute. Uh, okay, so let's start. Uh, I'll start the recording. Hope my screen is visible and I am loud and clear. Uh, yes. Okay, so I welcome you uh, to the weekly interactive session. My name is Shutanu Shadukhan. Good evening, and I am a teaching assistant uh, at IIT uh, Bombay, uh, where I am doing my PhD. Uh, and I am also a teaching assistant under NPTEL. Uh, the course code is C39, and the name is Water and Wastewater Treatment. Uh, instructed by Dr. Bhanu Prakash Bhilanki, who is uh, uh, an environmental engineering professor at the civil engineering department of IIT Rupi. Uh, today is Tuesday, 5th March. Uh, it is the sixth session, and with this session, actually 50% of the entire, uh, I mean, doubt clearing sessions or uh, uh, problem solving sessions, whatever you say, that will be completed so the uh, actually again the uh, all the uh, feedback forms have been floated uh, for for the coursework also and for the, uh, uh, the i mean live interactive session also uh, if you feel uh, if you have not yet filled up the form then uh, please fill up that if you are happy have filled and uh, if you feel you have to say something more, then again you can fill up those forms. Okay, I will encourage. I I think you are regularly getting uh, the email from the MPTL course teams regarding the uh, feedback. Okay, so now last week actually we solved a problem uh, where we had to determine the effluent BOD of wastewater flow of 10 MLD with certain design conditions. This was one problem that was solved last week. Uh, I don't know whether you were present uh, there or not. So all the data given in the problem was not required, especially the in inlet flow, inlet BOD was not required for calculating the outlet BOD, which was strange, which was a bit strange. And the formula that was used was something like this. The effluent BOD formula where you don't see any effluent BOD at the right hand side of the equation. Then we just put the useful data given uh, in the problem in that formula and we solve the uh, effluent BOD. But the person, I don't know, don't remember it was you or who, who was present in the last uh, class. Uh, he told that uh, he want explanation for this uh, problem. I mean, how, how, the, how, how this formula came into the picture. So today I, I will actually uh, derive this formula. So how, how this formula, uh, formula came into the picture. So I actually I also verbally discussed the derivation part. Again, I'll I'll show you for your convenience. So again, uh, mass balance equation that we use in a problem two weeks back that will be used. The equation is something like this: where MLSS concentration X equals to yield Y into BOD S consumed minus MLSS deactivated or decayed or died whatever. So the x that is the mlss concentration or the microbial concentration equals to 
into uh, if, if it is mixed trigger this term is mentioned then you will uh, feel that it is the live objects but if it is only suspended solid then uh, it, it is the total suspended solid out of which the ml ml means the bio, biological concentration it is it is actually denoted yield means there is an amount so inlet bod minus outlet bod that is the consumed bod out of that consumed bod entire amount is not converting to the biomass just like whatever we eat the entire food that we eat is not assimilated in our body right some part of the food is rejected some part of the food increases our body's mass similarly uh, the in case of microbial or microbes also there is a concept of yield i discussed that that is the percentage of the bod decreased that is getting converted to biomass theta is the uh, time uh, one is one is your retention level time hydro retention time and another one is cell retention time so to convert it from hydro hrt to uh, cell cell side it, it is actually required because uh, the one is in continuous flow and bacteria is or uh, present within that reactor only it is not incoming not even outgoing so that's why the time uh, scale conversion is required minus x into kd into uh, theta c kd is the coefficient which indicates the amount of the uh, a, a, amount of the biomass that got decayed or deactivated or died whatever and theta c is the time scale for the cells so this is the total bod consume uh, effective bod consume in terms of the yield minus the mlss that 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 died that is if you if you subtract this from this you will get the mlss that is present this actually formula we discussed two classes back this uh, mass balance equation will be used uh, if you just uh, simplify it further it will be something like this for the x that is currently present and the monod equation that we solved in an mcq two weeks back that will also be used for derivation so monod equation is this mu equals to mu max into s plus uh, divided by s plus ks equals to mu m divided by you just divide the entire denominator with the numerator s and it got uh, as 1 plus k s by s so this s and this s is the same it is the bod concentration only or it is the food so concentration actually is written within third bracket for simplification we just written it, written it as s rewritten it as s so now uh, uh you see there is a term called one by mu which is also termed as substrate specific growth rate why because you can see there is x term in the numerator and the substrate that is getting consumed and its effectiveness uh, by multiplying it with y so this entire thing i mean how much x is generated with how much substrate is consumed within this amount of time so this entire terminology is called as this substrate specific growth rate or it is 1 by mu it is de determined as 1 by mu so if we take the uh, i mean if we just reverse the mu it will be y into s not minus s by theta by x and you place that value of mu into this equation so you can look here is y that is s not minus s here is theta you take these three terms outside y divided by uh, y into sorry y into s not uh, minus s divided by theta whole divided by x you take that x this side and you replace that with this value of mu from the monod equation okay then we get something like this mu equals to 1 plus kd into theta c divided by theta c because these three terms got out equals to this term mu m divided by 1 plus k s by s or 1 plus k s by s if you take this into left hand side it becomes something like this mu m into the, the this part comes into the right hand side and it flips so it becomes theta c divided by 1 plus kd into theta c i hope it is uh, clear so far okay 
So then uh, you, you just look into this equation. Uh, we are starting from this that we just uh, derived in the last place and then uh, by continuation we just subtract one in the right hand side and it becomes something like this so this gets common and this this comes into the denominator with a minus sign this entire thing whole divided by whatever the denominator in the of the first term okay so then s comes at the right hand side and this entire thing comes at the left hand side and it gets stripped so s equals to becomes equals to ks divided by 1 plus kd into theta c uh, sorry ks divided by this whole thing so this gets again flipped so s becomes ks into the denominator 1 plus kd into theta c whole divided by this entire denominator we just uh, rearranged it because we are we will take this theta c common okay so after taking the theta c common this already remains in the numerator part and theta c uh, after taking it common it becomes mu m minus kd within first bracket minus one it it, it becomes a numerator so it is the formula which actually we earlier used in this problem in this problem so it is nothing but the, uh, this formula is developed based on the mass balance and the uh, monod equation only these two equations are required to derive the formula that we used uh, directly used in the last class okay so where you can see that uh, the, you are getting the effluent bod uh, but in the right hand side there is not influent bod is not there it is something strange but yes the formula actually s not was there in the earlier mass balance but it, it gets uh, cancelled out uh, during uh, simplification during putting the mu value into the equation so that's why uh the, the unnecessary data that was there in the question that it is not required but you have unfortunately you have to remember this formula so the, the, there will be either for in in exam they will ask for the derivation or they will ask for the problem itself then you have to remember this formula otherwise this formula may be given also then you you can just directly put uh the values uh of, of the terminologies so it depends on the marks if, if, it, if the marks of the marks is higher then you have to remember is max is lower than the formula is given that's all okay so now uh, i hope the derivation is clear that's our problem so in jigs logic yes 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 uh, it is there so we will come into that don't worry so this is the this is regarding the last class that actually one guy was there I don't, probably he was there i don't know so he asked to ask me to show this that's why i showed it so then uh, we will have our next problem. So next problem is something like this. A water sample has particle distribution and settling velocities as below. Okay. So particle size distribution is given like this. Uh, so size in millimeter is given 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Quantity, that is the mass fraction. So 0.3 millimeter particles is uh, has the 40 percent of the total mass and 0.4 millimeter particle has 60 percent of the total mass and they are respective settling velocity in millimeter per second unit is given as 0.25 and 0.3 now the total solids in suspended form is given as 500 gram and designed overflow rate is given as 0.3 millimeter per second now the problem statement is you have to calculate the efficiency in percentage of horizontal flow sedimentation tank with respect to mass removal i mean you have to calculate the mass removal efficiency or the total mass removal efficiency actually you have to calculate okay so what will be the removal efficiency of the uh, 0.4 millimeter particle and what will be the removal efficiency of the 0.3 millimeter particle then you have to add them up. okay in terms of mass so total mass is given as 500 gram and how much mass will be removed for 0.3 and 0.4 you just sum them up and divide it, it with 500 and multiply it with 100 that's all you have to do welcome Arjuna. we have uh, shown a particular derivation that we uh, did actually in last class uh, 
last class one guy was present he asked uh, that we should uh, discuss the derivation so that's why i uh, discussed the derivation of the formula so now we are uh, just uh, solving today's problem so today's problem starts with this please solve it in your copy i'll wait for uh, two to three minutes so i'll give you a hint for the solution of this problem you see there is a designated overflow rate right 0.3 millimeter uh, per second and you can see their respective vs that is the settling velocity is also provided so if the settling velocity uh, of that particular sized particle is more than or equal to 0.3 millimeter per second then that particle will be removed 100 percent but if there is a, I mean, if, if the settling velocity of that particular, particular particle is lower than the designated overflow rate, then it will not be removed 100%. So what fraction will it uh, get removed? That fraction will actually determine by the ratio between these two velocities. The settling velocity, and the, you can see 0.3 by 0.3 is 100%. It's 0.25 by 0.3. That percentage you have to calculate. That is the actually uh, crux here in the problem. The other rest of the problem is very easy. You please uh, solve, solve it in your uh, copy and give me the answer. I will wait for one minute more. <coughs> actually, today's, uh, I mean, in the second half, uh, latter, uh, latter uh, portion of the classes, at the last, last uh, half an hour, you may expect the Chick's law and Chick's uh, law problem may come. Yeah. If, if time permits, otherwise we'll discuss it in next uh, class. Please also ask what do you want. Sir, so there are two long sections going on simultaneously. There's what? There are two live sessions are going. Yes, yes, I, I know that. From the day one only, it is like that way. See, so how can we... why it is done? Let me explain. So uh, it actually depends on the number of total number of people that is joining the course. Okay. So if if the total number of people joining the course is very high, then there are multiple PMRF TS who take the sessions so that uh, people can choose to join in different sessions. They can do one on one interaction. Okay. But if uh, if the number of total number of people joining the course is less, then the uh, then there will be only one or two TS like that. So the total number of people they, they have registered for this course is very high. So that's why uh, three there are three TS. You can join any one session as per your convenience. The content that we uh, that I uh, I also told in my previous sessions, the content those are uh, being delivered in all these sessions are uh, more or less same. So, uh, I mean, there is no, not very, you can, you can attend any one or you can uh, attend the recording also, whichever you like. And you can also not attend also. If you have any doubt in your, uh, let's say, pro problem solving uh, during your assignment, then you can, you can uh, go to that particular uh, week's uh, discussion session, you can, you can refer that. It entirely depends on you, how you manage. You can see there are thousands of people who have registered for this course, but only two two or ten people attend so in in every one session it, it actually happens so it actually totally depends on you how how you, you should we will do so there is no uh, uh, i mean hard and fast rule all all the three ts actually they one is, one is in uh, one ta delivers in the friday sessions and two ta including me delivers in today's session so all the three uh, ts uh, delivers almost the same content a little bit difference may be there uh, based on their uh, way of explanation. So it, it actually, you are free to attend any session. Okay. So yes, please, this problem, uh, Prashant, have you solved? Otherwise, I'll move on to the solution. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, useful data given. That is uh, in the problem. All all the data given are basically useful. So total uh, suspended solids in suspended form is given as 500 gram, and this is the table. So 
if you multiply the mass fraction that is 40 percent and 60 percent with this 500 gram then what you will get you will get 200 gram and 300 gram this is the mass allocation so 0.3 sized 0.3 millimeter sized particle is present in 200 gram uh, mass and 0.4 uh, millimeter particle is present in 300 uh, one gram quantity hope this is clear oh you have calculated 100 percent 83 percent yes so now what you will have to do this is the uh, this is individual allocation that is fine so you have to then uh, uh, i mean multiply this 200 gram with that 100 percent sorry uh, you have to multiply this uh, 300 gram with that 100 percent and 200 gram with that 83 percent get the total mass and divide that divide that total mass with 500 gram into 100 percent that will be your answer so i'll solve it for you so the detailed solution goes something like this any particle having size such that its settling velocity gs is greater than or equals to the given overflow rate of the tank which is given as in the question 0.3 millimeter per second then you will get 100 percent removal if it is less than vs for example, in this case, so if the VS is less than your 0.3, which is in this case 0.25, so then it will be a uh, it will be a ratio of 0.25 and 0.3 that we will see later. So BS of the 0.4 millimeter particle we see uh, is greater uh, 0.4 millimeter and greater size particles is greater than equals to the overflow rate that is 0.3 millimeter per second. Okay, hope it is clear. So, um, you can see, uh, so there is a drag force formula. Do you remember that? We actually derived, on, uh, uh, derived also another formula based on the drag force formula in the last class, Stokes law region. If you remember, if you have watched the uh, recording, F D equals to 6 pi eta RV, it was something like that. 6 pi mu RV, or 3 pi mu dv so you can relate that thing so there is a relationship between this vs and this particle size so that's why it has been told as 0.4 millimeter and the greater size particle okay however so now uh, let's uh, move in forward the solids having 0.4 meter and greater size particle with will be removed as 100 percent as i told earlier so that's why its removal will be 100 uh, sorry, its removal fraction will be mass removal fraction will be one, and 0.3 milliliter sized particles is 0.25 is the VS and overflow rate is 0.3. So as I told that there will be a ratio. Uh, you have probably calculated it at 85 percent, 83 percent. I hope it is correct. So if you multiply this with this total mass, that is 500 gram. Somewhere it is no, not 500 gram. This this total mass of the 0.3 millimeter size particle, then 200 into that 83 percent becomes uh, 166.67. This is the mass removed of the 0.3. And for case of 0.4 meter size particles, as it is uh, your designated velocity, it is greater than equals to. So that's why it, it will be removed by 100 percent. The one into this uh, value, what is it? Yes, 300. So, one into 300 is 300, 200 into this fraction is this one. So, this is the total mass that will get removed. Okay. Uh, so, yes, I hope uh, you understand that. So, yes, it is 83.3 percent, 83.33, I think. So, if you multiply it to 200, it will be something like this. Okay. So, then solution goes like this way. The total mass that is removed is 166.67 plus 3. Uh, sorry, I think there is a problem. Uh, sorry, it will be 300. This value is correct. It goes to 466.67. Okay, because this gets removed by 100%. Right? Uh, hope it is clear. Any doubt you can ask. Then efficiency of mass removal becomes 466.67 divided by 500. 
that is the total uh, mass of the total particle that was present equals to 93.33 percent is the answer so it is an weighted uh, weighted average right other if if uh, let's say if the mass allocation instead of 200 and 300 it was 250 250 that means 50 50 percent then you could just directly take the average of 183 right but it is the, the both both they, they are not in 50 50 ratio so that's why you have to take the weighted average 100 you can take like this way 100 into uh 200 by uh 100 uh, 100 into 40 percent basically 100 into 40 percent plus 83 into 60 percent this is the weighted average so in this way also you can uh, uh, take the value i will take the calculate the answer okay so I hope it is clear. Any doubt, you can ask the problem, how it is solved. OK. Where is it? Huh. Now, we will move on to our next uh, MCQ, I guess. What are the potential consequences of sludge bulking? in wastewater treatment plants so the options are option a is reduced treatment efficiency and increased efficient solid effluent solids option b is uh, increased increase in energy consumption and operational costs option c is obstruction of pipes and equipment in the treatment process and option d is all of the above uh, please type your answer in the chat box On this saying all of the above. What's on your hand is still raised? Do you want to say something or it is just what's on? You can uh, lower your hand, okay? So, uh, I think you have uh, given the correct answer all of the above. Uh, are the potential consequences of sludge bulking in your enterprise. I hope you understand what sludge bulking is. We will also solve few more questions on sludge bulking to understand the concept in a uh, deeper way. Okay. Sludge bulking means when there is lot of, uh, see, uh, it is an activated sludge. Why is the term activated sludge is there? Activated sludge processor AS, ASP. So there is an amount of sludge or organic matter. So within that organic matter, there is uh, some uh, component as or a total suspended matter. So within that matter, there is some component which is activated as mixed liquor, volatile suspended or even BSS or something. And some, some part is non-activated. That is SS total solids minus that MLS. So th that part is not activated. Okay, deactivated. So, sludge bulking means what? When the activated part gets reduced and the non activated part is increased. So, total, so that is called a sludge bulking. So, it's a bulky in nature and, and it is not efficient in treating the water. And it, it actually reduced, it reduces the treatment efficiency if sludge bulking offers. Okay, foaming occurs, froth, froth, you can see in the aeration tank. So, if you have visited in any water treatment plant, uh, if any, uh, if either one of you is from uh, uh, B.Tech background and you have done some some industrial training in some TSUs, because uh, if you can see in the private companies they maintain their uh, treatment plan very well, but PSUs actually don't. The government company they don't maintain their. Nowadays things are changing, but earlier days they did maintain their. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, treatment plant very well. Sometimes big big agitators were rotating, but there was no bacteria. All are dead, and it, it was actually causing the sludge bulk. So that's why uh, if, if there are a lot of dead organic matter, uh, the pumping cost will increase because pumps impeller will face, uh, I mean, face obstacle to pump that uh, sludge uh, into uh, through through the system to recirculate that sludge. Uh, during recycling so all the all the operational cost that's why increase and also uh, 
the pipe may get get also choked <clears throat> if there is a uh, organic uh, bulky organic matter present in the uh, process okay so that's why all of the above are correct so now we will move on to our next uh, mcq which one of the following is not a variation of the activated sludge process uh, used for nutrient removal in wastewater treatment plant option a option a sequential batch reactor option b membrane bioreactor option c extended radiation option d rotating biological contactor which one of the following is not a variation of activated sludge process which one is not an activated sludge process Please write your answer in the chat box. Question is saying D. Orchana. Okay. So uh, we'll move on to the solution. Rotating biological contactor or RBC is the correct answer. Uh -huh, yes, you have also told. So it is correct. So now we will move on to our next MCQ again. So which one of the following is not an advantage of biological phosphorus removal over chemical precipitation method? Actually, I, I hope you have watched uh, my last class recording, right? There was a complicated problem. Someone was... Uh, actually uh, telling i mean who was present in the class uh, he was fair got faded he actually couldn't go, go through the entire problem it was a iterative method so that's why it was a bit hectic for uh, for the last class so that's why i kept a bit uh, i mean easier for this class i i actually increased the number of mcqs in this class <laughs> though we will solve problem in the second half no issues about that so first we will solve a bit, uh, certain uh, number of mcqs okay so option a is low chemical consumption option b low sludge production option c high phosphorus removal efficiency and option d is high chemical consumption so which one among them is not an advantage of biological phosphorus removal over chemical uh, precipitation So by chemically phosphorus is chemically phosphorus can be removed uh, and biologically phosphorus can also be removed. Biological organisms basically takes the phosphorus because phosphorus, as I uh, one uh, we saw in two earlier classes I think two classes earlier that N P and K nitrogen phosphorus and potassium these three are critical elements critical all also for plant growth and critical also for bacterial growth or growth of the biological organisms in activated sludge process so if, uh, if what will they, uh, they do if the phosphorus is present inside the water they will simply eat it i mean eat it means they will assimilate it in their uh, in their cells right as by, by as organic matter so within the water the phosphorus will become less in quantity in this way the phosphorus can also be removed or it can also be chemically precipitated so which one of the following is not an advantage of biological removal over the chemical removal of phosphorus? Orchona, no, nobody has told. Okay, please take your time. One minute. Low chemical consumption should be an advantage, right? Because biologically removed will definitely take less chemical as compared to chemical precipitation. So this should be an advantage. Low sludge production, I don't know. High phosphorus removal efficiency, I don't know. Ah, this, this should be an advantage. High chemical consumption. So the, you can see the, the, the just just by looking at the options, you can eliminate one. This is the low chemical consumption, this is a high chemical consumption. These two are contradictory, you can say, right? So one of them um, uh, is, is basically not an advantage. Okay, not, still not answering. It is very easy. 
So you can see the answer is high chemical conjunction, right? Because biological phosphorus removal itself is used so that the chemical conjunction gets lowered. So this is definitely not an advantage. Okay, now clear it is in this layer. Okay. Uh, so these steps uh, for a breakpoint chlorination are given below. You have to rearrange these steps as per the correct sequence. Number one is destruction of chloramines and chloroorganic compounds. Number two is formation of chloroorganic compounds and chloramines. Number three, destruction of chlorine by readily reducing compounds. And number four, formation of free, free chlorine. So there is a process called as chlorination, which is used for disinfection for removing or uh, bacteria and virus or microbes from the wastewater. So the, there are these are the steps for of chlorination. You have to rearrange them. These are not in a correct order or maybe in correct order. It may be one, two, three, four also. You can even just write the sequence in the chat box. Both of you. I'll give you two minutes. Oshanti is telling us three, two, four, one. Okay, Archana. For one more minute, you can type in the chat box. Push on this telling, uh, or sorry, three to one for your telling. 3, 2, 4, 1, 3, 2, 1, 4. Which one will be the last one? 1 or 4? This one is going to close and come on. Okay. Archana? Okay. Hmm. Which one of Prashant do you think is correct? And Archana, or, see, Prashant has given two answers. 3, 2, 4, 1 and 3, 2, 1, 4. What do you think, Archana, that which one of these two is correct? Second, okay. No, no, I, I understand that. The person corrected his earlier uh, question and he actually, you actually, the second one, you, you think it is correct? Orchona, what do you think about person's answer? We are just all three only. You can, you can just unmute yourself and. Uh, Switch on your, uh, both of you can switch on your uh, uh, video camera also, <coughs> if you feel comfortable, otherwise, no hard and fast. So, okay. So, the thing is that, see, the what will be the option one? So, the destruction, the, which was option three, the destruction of chlorine by readily reducing compound. Uh, next, uh, okay. So uh, there, there are reducing compounds that is present inside the uh, reducing compounds means the microorganisms only who will be actually oxidized by the food. So they are first in high quantity. You you introduce a, uh, a I mean small amount of chlorine. They gradually you, you increase the flow rate. So first the chlorine will be destroyed by the reducing compound. So option three is the correct. Uh, so option three is the option one basically sequence. Then Formation of chloroorganic compounds and chloramines. So these two have you have uh, told it correctly. So second option remains in its place. So first the, it gets oxidized uh, by this oxidation reduction reaction. The chloroorganic compounds and chloramines gets formed. Then destruction of chloramines and chloroorganic compounds occurs. Why? Because you are inserting more and more chlorine. Again. You are inserting more and more chlorine such that they are after their complete destruction, there is residual amount of free chlorine that is present inside the uh, inside the uh, what is called uh, wastewater. So you can see 
that uh, yes so 3 2 4 1 this is the correct sequence as uh, prashant has rectified because uh, as i as i told in my in, in, the, in, our, in my first or second class i don't remember so where i described about uh, what is uv treatment what is ozone treatment and what is chlorine treatment the main difference between UV, ozone treatment and chlorine treatment is ozone has got a shorter lifespan but chlorine has got a higher lifespan so free chlorine after uh, treating uh, the water after making it free from microorganisms also the chlorine is present inside the water because it, it is important for, for a country like india where big big pipes are there you will be delivering the water to some long distances the municipality will be delivering and um, who knows that uh, within in the mid middle there is some leakage and uh, through that leakage in the pipe the outside uh, I mean, contaminant or pollutant is entering into, into that pipe, right? Or there may be some biofilm formation, some stagnant zone formation um, in the pipeline, uh, where it, it is uh, being delivered over long distance, right? So that's why the presence of the free chlorine, even after the treatment, it is required. The presence of the free chlorine in the water. So whenever it it will. Uh, be distributed then also the free chlorine that is present inside the water that will actually work as a uh, disinfectant if if some contaminant contamination of the water occurs during distribution process uh, hope you understand so that's why the formation of the free chlorine is the last step uh, people people it is it is easy to get confused here so whatever you have rectified it the three two one four is the Correct sequence. Okay. So I'm talking about two order. Now uh, we will move on to our next rearrangement portion. So the characteristics growth phases of a pure culture of microbes are given below. Okay. Option A. I mean A is stationary phase. B exponential growth phase. C endogenous phase or death phase. And D is declining growth phase. You uh, give the correct, correct sequence, both of you. Try to write. I will wait for two minutes. Both of you are telling no. Poshan is telling A B D C. Orchona is telling C B A D. A B D C means stationary, then exponential, then declining, and then endogenous. That's what. Portion this thing, not just thing, CBAD. That means endogenous after that exponential, after that stationary. After that. I think uh, both of you are not correct in this case. I mean, I, I also don't remember the answer. Let's see what is there. Um, uh, so, you see, the first phase to start with is the exponential growth phase. So, B will be the what? nobody of you no none of you have identified b as the first of them so exponent it starts with exponential growth phase okay we will see later that how how the i i i actually knew that there will be some problem in understanding this growth phase curve so that's why i i actually i'll discuss it later in a bit detail so after the exponential growth phase comes the declining growth phase okay so after declining growth phase, stationary phase occurs. After that, endogenous phase occurs. So B D A C is the correct sequence. Now none of you have identified it as B D A C. 
Okay, BDSE is the correct sequence. Okay, so now we will actually look at the curve. Car, uh, so how, how the growth phases actually uh, occur. Okay, so there is, I mean, if you plot the concentration of the microbes or cells in y axis uh, with respect to time in the x axis, you will get a curve something like this. So it is an S shaped curve. It is sometimes called as the sigmoid curve. Okay, viable cell concentration means they are not considering the bulky sludge, they are only considering the MLVSS, that is the activated sludge. Okay, activated sludge or whatever. I mean, viable means they are able to reproduce, they are alive. Okay. So, this is a log scale. If it is a normal scale, then you, you will see that it is just like an S. Okay. This is called a, because of its S, S nature, it is called as the sigmoid curve. I think Proshan confused the lag phase with the stationary phase. So, that's why you, you consider the lag phase to be uh, number one phase, I think. Uh, but but lag phase is something lag phase is called uh, also called as the phase of acclimatization acclimatization means what when you are introducing a new food to 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 a microbial population let's say what will happen the population uh, will take time uh, to adjust with the environment Okay, so this process of adjustment with the environment is called the acclimatization. They don't just readily start to eat, eat those foods. Food means the BOD or the pollutant matter that is present in the water. They just really don't start to eat those foods. They take some time to adjust with the environment. They, they just, see, if you, if you just give a food to dog or cat, they just don't, or, or, or bunny, that is uh, rabbit, they just don't come and eat, they don't do that immediately. We human beings are <laughs> kind of different. We just, whatever, we get a pizza, we just really start eating. Also, also we take some time, right? We, we click photos and everything we post, then we actually eat that. So we have also having certain lag phases. Okay, but it is different from the animals. We will see that they just smell it, they check it, the food, then they start eating that, right? So, and also they adjust with the environment. That, that, they see whether there is a thread at their side, so someone is coming to eat that food or not. So there is a, there is no thread, a safe environment. They start if they believe and they start eating that, right? So this is called as the lag phase. After that, there is a once they start, they starts I mean eating very quickly. So similar case for microbes also. They after they acclimatize, they will accelerate their growth. Okay, so this is that's why this is called as the accelerated growth phase. So again, the growth occurs linearly after certain times. Whenever you see the food is nearing completion, so the microbes they will eat the food and they will grow in numbers, right? So that means the food available for individual microbes will reduce over time. That's why. Whenever there will be high competition, then the growth of the microbes will be lower, will be lowered. Okay, so there will, after a certain time, there will come certain phase where there will be no growth in their population. That means they, they, in the stationary phase, the microbial pollutants that is available, uh, I mean, the pollutants, the micro pollutants that is available for, for uh, the microbes to eat is equal equal so the amount of the microbes that is available the amount of food available is just exact so that's why there is no growth there is no death so after that what will happen the food will get exhausted so then the number of microbes the which are available at that point of time all of them will not get the food so that's why who, whoever will not get their death will occur and whoever will get they, they will survive so that's why their number will uh, decrease, right? So this is also called as the endogenous phase. After that, there is also a certain increase in, in number. It is called as the cryptic growth. So if you, if you see any kinds of, you know, not only the microbial population, if you see 
any kind of uh, let's say any species if you consider a particular species in a particular region if you even if you consider uh, the total human population on earth itself so you, you see human population is currently going uh, at this pace is declining kind of that declining phase or here human population is kind of here now okay so any species population you will you actually show this nature but in case of microbes after this nature there is certain increase it is it is called as the cryptic growth cryptic growth means what you see there are dead matter of the or, 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 i mean the microbes those have died so their body uh, has been disintegrated and from their body the organic matter has come into the solution right the so the the, the microbes the, who are surviving they will eat that matter and they will again uh, man, i mean man, man, multiply in number so that's why the growth that is observed based on the dead organic matter that is called as the cryptic growth but it is not general in other cases let's say you considering a species of tiger you are considering a species of uh, let's say deer or human so no, they don't eat uh, dead dead bodies of their own species so that's why this type of that's certain rare species may be there but this kind of growth cryptic growth is not observed in case of uh, human population or other population but it is observed in case of microbial population but up to it is out of syllabus up to this from starting from lag phase up to the death phase only you have to remember so you just remember the sigmoid curve so first is lag it is lag means acclimatization after that accelerated growth uh, then stationary I mean, the growth phase itself has two parts one is accelerated part and another is declining part after the stationary part after that the endogenous part so whatever uh, so I, I hope it is clear um, so this is called as the sigmoid growth curve sigmoid what this a it looks like s so that's why this a, c, s for sigmoid like that right okay so uh, okay so i hope it is clear so let's uh, move on to our next question you have to identify which of the following statement is or are correct statement one is uh, the lack of growth that is observed in the microbial population during the endogenous phase is due to the scarcity of substrate i hope you, you will be able to answer whether this statement is correct or not because we just saw the curve of that and uh, statement two is the mechanism of uv disinfection is that it disinfects by directly damaging the nucleic acids of the pathogen nucleic acid means cells has got cytoplasm and, and within the cytoplasm there is a nucleus within the nucleus there are nucleic acid nucleic acid means the genetic material the dna rna etc that is present inside the pathogens here they are telling that uv disinfection actually damages the nucleic acid so that the pathogens cannot multiply in number so in this way uv disinfection occurs there but they are not only multiply they also their cell functions also gets hampered so that's why they die in this way uv disinfection occurs so you have to identify which one of this statement is correct which one of this statement is false option two uh, uh, i mean statement two are you telling us correct or both you are telling us correct and option also I mean, it is easy. You should be able to answer. What's <laughs> not? Read it. Read it carefully. You will be able to answer. I say. I mean, whether they all these statements are wrong or all these statements are correct or one of them are correct. Both are correct. You are saying. I think it is correct. Okay. Yes. Truly. I mean. Uh, true that both uh, both these sentences are correct actually okay so now we'll move on to our next uh, uh, said rearrangement problem i think let's see so the components of a typical process flow chart for a sequential batch reactor or sbr are given below uh, and you have to rearrange them as per the correct sequence so option uh, so the components are uh, number one component is pumping, then decanting, then sedimentation, then aeration, then disinfection. 
you just uh, rearrange them uh, as, uh, as per uh, the process flow chart for a SBR. I'll wait for uh, two minutes. Those of you try to answer. If you have uh, listened to the lecture of sir, then you okay. Option has been answered. One, four, three to five. Four, three to five. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Question also. Okay. Both of you are giving the same answer. I think the answer should be correct. So first option is pumping, right? Because whatever the wastewater that will come, you will first pump it into your system. If you, if, you, if you have seen any type of wastewater treatment plant, you will see that mostly in the inlet, there will be mandatorily a pump. And the pump actually takes care of the entire pressure drop that is occurring through all the sequential processes. If a certain capacity enhancement project or something is done at a latter stage, uh, the design in enhanced, let's say, based on the green, uh, based on the brown field. So in that case, you will see in a later stage there will be a booster pump or something. But but what happens in most of the cases? Uh, pump, pumping actually is, uh, is the starting point of the process. Then the aeration, the, uh, the most of the, I mean. The aerobic bacteria actually it is the thing uh, at the beginning. After that, sedimentation, then decantation. Uh, <coughs> decantation means the separation of the sediments from the uh, uh, from the supernatant, that is the purified water. Then the disinfection. Disinfections come at the last. Why? Because for when the process is going. Then also, you will see that uh, there, there may be certain dead zones may occur within the uh, process. So there, uh, the formation of biofilm and uh, subsequent contamination of the water by pathogen may occur. So that's why the, at the last stage, there will always be a disinfection before the, the, before the distribution of the treated water. Okay, so both of you have given the correct sequence only. It is one, four, three, two, five. Yes. Okay. So this is the uh, typical diagram of a sequencing batch reactor. First, it, it actually <coughs> comes in a retention tank. After that, it comes in a. This is it is not a part of the uh, SBR basically. It's a pre-treatment kind of thing. After that, the pump is there. So it first it comes into the aeration, then your uh, after that aeration pumping, then it comes into the sedimentation or settling, whatever you may like. Drop means the decantation. There is there is the excess sludge is taken with water is present inside the excess sludge and it is there is a continuous gravity decanter. It is called a CGD within which it is rotated either in vertical motion vertical. Uh, it is kept either in vertical CGD or it is it may be a horizontal CGD depending on the space that is available with the, with the uh, organization. So after that, uh, before the effluent is uh, discharged, actually there is a presence of the disinfection. It may be chlorine, ozone, or UV depending on the processes. Okay. So okay. So I think uh, it is uh, eight seven. We will take for a uh, three minutes break. Let's say we will join rejoin at eight ten sharp. Eight ten or eleven we will join. Three to four minutes break we will take. Okay, short break. Please join in the same link.
or if you have any doubt, uh, I am here. You can ask question. Okay, no doubt. Uh, we'll join at 8 a.m. sharp. 8, 10 or 11. Okay, Prashant has left. <clears throat> Okay, so we will restart. Let's so hope Prashant rejoins. We will continue. Okay, so now we have to select the correct statement regarding disinfection methods. This is an MCQ, that is multiple select question. More than one option may or may not be correct. So option A is ozone forms residuals in the disinfection process. Option B, the disinfection efficiency of chlorine decreases by increasing the time of contact. Option C, turbidity affects ultraviolets removal efficiency and option d is ozone requires relatively shorter contact time than chlorination uh, what is the question uh, we have to uh, uh, the correct statement regarding disinfection method MCQ 
A, B, C, D, which one is correct or more than one is correct, just type. You just only you can see on see only the three things, right? Ozone, chlorine, and UV. These three are only important uh, disinfection methods. So the, the all these four options are based on uh, three. These three only. Ozone, UV, and chlorine. You remember what I discussed based on ozone, chlorine, and UV, and you will be able to answer. Or if you have watched uh, the lectures, um, weekly lectures of SAR, then also you will be able to answer. Question is not joining. You please type your answer in the chat box or so now. Okay. Whether ozone forms residuals? Residual means residual ozone. Free chlorine is formed. Ozone does not form residual, I think. So option one, I, I think it is not correct. The other options, C option C, I think it is correct. Then B and D, you, you think. Not able to think. Chlorine decreases by. You can unmute. I mean, just you can directly talk. Not even typing is not required. Only one on so the, the okay. Let's see what is the answer then. So option C and D is the correct answer. Okay. The disinfection efficiency of anything will increase if you increase the time of contact, not even chlorine. So no doubt about that. So option B is not correct, right? Ozone does not form residual. I uh, Chlorine actually is meant for forming residuals. Chlorine is that's why countries like Finland and etc. They prefer ozone treatments. And countries like India, Bangladesh, China they prefer chlorine treatment. And where you have to supply the water for long distances for for a large number of people. But if that distribution network is that not that robust, not that big, uh, then you can use ozone <clears throat> treatment for non-bulky systems. And turbidity, why it is it affects the visible efficiency because UV is a basically optical process. Turbidity means there are more particles that is present inside the water. Particles means that may or may not be the microorganisms. UV is targeting the microorganisms, right? But the intensity of the UV light is absorbed by the particles, uh, uh, by the turbidity causing particles present inside the water. So that's why turbidity actually decreases the UV's removal efficiency. The more the turbidity, the less the removal. Okay. Uh, but if the turbidity is caused by the, uh, no, not by dead something, not by inorganic uh, particles, uh, turbidity caused by the microorganism itself, then it will not affect. So that's why increase or decrease it is not mentioned, only the effects is mentioned. And ozone requires relatively shorter contact time than chlorination. Because ozone is more efficient. Right? And ozone's lifetime is also less. So it does not sustain in the water for long distances. It just uh, disinfects and then it is gone like that way. And it, it, I mean, the killing power of ozone is more than the chlorine. So if you, if you just take the human example, if you if you just inhale ozone and if you inhale chlorine, so chlorine, I mean, you will be you will feel dizzy, problem will occur, and you just go to the hospital and it will be uh, I mean it will be treated. But if you take ozone, it's a kind of life-threatening thing. I mean, it is more harmful than chlorine. So that's why for microorganisms also, it is, that's why ozone requires shorter time for disinfection than chlorination. Simple. Welcome, Prashant. We just discussed one uh, <coughs> MSQ. Okay.
so the next msq is sludge bulking can usually be controlled by i told you earlier that there will be question on sludge bulking to understand this concept in a bit uh, deeper way option a is adjusting food by microbes ratio option b is reducing the sludge edge option c is aeration option d is de uh, denitrification so how can you control the sludge bulk by all the by controlling all of them or a few of them or none of them option a what tell me adjusting food by microbes ratio uh, yes i think it is uh, i believe it is correct i mean more than one option may be correct or maybe one option only reducing the sludge edge what do you think what is, what is sludge edge the time a sludge remains in a particular system aeration okay aeration do you know what aeration is aeration reunification everything is so we'll uh, go to the answer so aeration is not an answer so sludge bulking means what if you just focus on the definition you will be able to understand right that what basically aeration do aeration don't affect the total population aeration basically the aerobe bacteria that is present inside the water they needs oxygen to degrade the uh, micro pollutants right that's why aeration is uh, required and sludge bulking is what as i told earlier so there is total suspended solids or total solids minus the ml vss or ml ss so this difference actually the inactivated part gets increased so that is called the sludge bulking so aeration has no effect on it denitrification has no effect on it but if you increase the time a particular sludge stays in a particular system it obviously becomes chunk will occur so sludge bulking will be more and if you reduce the sludge edge, you reduce the time for which a particular uh, particular amount of sludge stays in a particular system then what will happen sludge bulking will be reduced and food by microbes ratio is obvious if you give more food microbes will be more if you give uh, less food more uh, pollutants uh, the nature of pollutant is such that the microbes are not able to eat it and generate uh, and grow in numbers or they are maybe eating it and they are also their dying rate is uh, also high so in that case what will happen the, the dead bacteria will increase dead dead microbes will increase in the process so it's the sludge will become bulky okay. so we'll move on to our next msq which one which one or more of the following is not an attached growth process okay option a is trickling filter option b is mbbr option c is sbr option d is mbr option d e is rbc and option f is asp the sbr we actually discussed in our earlier mcq it is in sequential uh, batch reactor i think sequential batch reactor batch or biology i don't remember okay mbbr means moving bed biological reactor is a for full form mbr means membrane bioreactor rbc means rotating biological contact it is not bed per se tickling filter means uh, tickling filter tickling filter and asp is activate the sludge process so which is which one or which one or more of the following is not an attached growth process attached growth means what <clears throat> if activated sludge process is not an attached growth process or i mean it is a difficult question you will just uh, see if you, if you just because there are too many reactors right if you just see the picture you will you will remember it you will just uh, you will just by looking at the options just you will you'll continue just try to remember uh, what uh, how how what is the reactor how how it looks like then you will be able to answer it correctly <clears throat> or try 
I also don't remember which one is correct. In this case, uh, oh, you see. Um, so the answer is SBR, MBR, and activated slash process. Okay, Proshant has given correct answer only. More will be MBR is also not an attached growth process. Attached growth process means what? So there will be a, uh, I mean. The microbial, uh, the microbes or the microbial colony that is present in the water for the treatment that is not attached on the surface of the equipment. Simple. So you will see that RBC, MBB are tickling beetle in all the cases. The, the microbial population is actually attached on the equipment surface. But in SBR, MBR and ASP, they are not. In ASP, ASP, there are microbes, but they are continuously recirculating in the system. They are not attaching, particularly in a, of the equipment process, right? On the equipment process. And in case of MBR, MBR means what? Membrane is used in case in the MBR, and the MLSS concentration inside the MBR is more than that is present inside the aeration. Why? It just separates out of the of the it just separates out the pure water that is present. Uh, that is present inside the uh, mixed liquor. It, it separates the water out and it uh, within the retained side of the membrane, the uh, microbes uh, remain. Okay. So they are not attaching on the membrane surface. If they are attaching, the membrane will, uh, is, will not uh, perform well. So they are not supposed to attach on the membrane surface. They are just supposed to get separated out. Okay, so it's not an attached growth process. They are not supposed to grow on the membrane surface after attaching. But in case of rotating biological contactor, the tickling filter and MBPR, all the processes, in all the A, B, and E processes, they are actually attached growth process. We'll, we'll see, we'll understand with a picture. So this is the picture of what? <clears throat> Unmute and talk. Only two, are, two of you are there. Okay, and this is a picture of what? And see, there is a drum, it will rotate, right? This is a front view of the drum, it is a side view of the drum. This is a shaft, there is a motor, it will rotate. There is, there is, there is, there is uh, water which is contaminated, and within the, on the drum, actually, basically, the microbes are present. So that's why it is a rotating biological conductor. The biological, biological microorganisms are present on the surface of the drum. They are attached and they are growing on the surface of the drum. And it is rotating. So microbes are getting food that is the micropollutants from the water and they are purifying that water. Simple. And what is the right one? It is the membrane bioreactor. It is not an attached growth process. Why? Because there is no attachment of the microorganisms. They are just floating on the water. On the equipment surface, they are not attaching. Okay. And this one is the MBBR, moving bed bioreactor. And this one is tickling filter. It is an attached process because the microbes are attaching on the surface of the equipment. They are stationary. The water is flowing through them and they are actually growing in number as they are taking micropollutants as a food from the flowing water. And the last one is the activated sludge process, where you can see the sludge is actually rotating in the system. Okay. So only the, the RBC and the MBR uh, are attached processes. And sequential batch reactor we uh, saw in the earlier one, the ASB. The tickling filter is also an attached process, but ASBR, MBBR, ASP, uh -huh. This is on ASP. 
these experimental sulfurs, they are, they are, they, they are, the microbes are floating on the uh, reactor, but they are not attaching any, any equipment surface for the growth. So here, here they are, they, their movement is stationary with respect to the equipment surface, they, but here they are in motion with respect to the equipment surface. That is, that's all is the difference. I hope it is clear. What is an attached growth process and what is not? Okay. That ASP, yes, ASP is not an attached process, true. RBC is an attached process. <coughs> RBC means rotating biological contact. Red blood cells is not. Okay. Now, you have to select the characteristics of biological system with high food by microbes ratio. It is an again and multiple select question. That is more than one option may or may not be correct. So option A is excess, excess food for microbes. Option B is microbes have low energy to swim around. Option C is good settling flux formation. And option D is fast microbial growth rate. If you increase the food by microbes ratio, that means what? Either the microbes is decreased and or the food is increased. What will happen in that case? Tell me. <clears throat> Is this one? We are just increasing the food. So option A will, yes. Option A is correct. Because food you are increasing, so there is excess food. Simple. D, that is fast microbial growth. Yes, it's also true. Because food is more, so that's why microbes will go faster. Go faster. Also, do you also think the same? Okay, MD, both of you are telling. Yes, it is correct answer. Uh, <clears throat> so, if, if it was there that microbes have low space to swim around, then it, it I mean, it, uh, I mean, we had to give, give a thought whether it is correct or not, depending on the system, how, how depending on the flow pattern, depend on the reaction pattern that is batch reaction or plug flow reaction or mixed reaction or whatever. So then we had to give a thought if there is a space instead of energy, but Energy means what? I mean, they will, they will, they will have more food, so that's why they, they will have more energy to swim around, right? So it depends. It actually depends. That's why option B is may not be correct. And good settling, settling flock has nothing to do with the food microbes ratio. That's why both of you have given the correct answer. Next, what is the correct sequence of formation of the following compounds during the chlorination of water? in which ammonia is present. It is an MCQ, that is multiple choice question. So you have to select the sequence. Option A is NCl3, then NH2Cl, then NHCl2. Option B is NH2Cl, then NHCl2, then NHCl, NCl3. Option C is NHCl2, then NCl3, then NH2Cl, and option D is NH2Cl, then NCl3, then NHCl2. You see, Ammonia that is NH3 that is presential. The nitrogen is center and there are three hands with three hydrogens. Okay. You are gradually giving chlorine. Right. To treat it. So hydrogen will gradually remove, hydrogen will gradually replace by chlorine. Simple. Yes. So portion, I mean is needs no further explanation. So you can see there is two hydrogen, one chlorine. So that means one NH3, one hydrogen got removed. After that, one <coughs> hydrogen again got removed with another chlorine. So it becomes Cl2, it becomes one H. After that, again, this single hydrogen also got removed. So all the three hydrogen was replaced by NCl3. So option B is the correct answer. Okay. Also, you should have also answered this. This is easy. Okay. Maybe you are. Uh, Feeling bored, so it is so easy. What to answer? <laughs> Maybe you are fewer feeling like that. <laughs> That's why you are not giving the answer. It may be true. I don't know. If it is second way, then it's okay. But if it is first way, then it is not because it is easy. You should give answer. Okay. So now, 
you have to select the correct characteristics of what i gave uh, the answer ha huh? what i have written option b okay okay oh oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry 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 i didn't know sorry sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay 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 yes 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 it is highly indexed okay then uh, multiple select question select the correct characteristics of 90 pairs so option a is highly selective towards do resolve action option b is lesser retention time than heterotrophs option c is highly sensitive towards toxin option d is do can be used as a measure to control nitrification and denitrification processes okay so i'll wait for 2 minutes it is an mcq that msq that means more than one option may be correct highly sensitive towards d in case of 90 pairs what are heterotrophs basically they are organisms who eats other plants or animals for energy and nutrients so they are highly sensitive to toxin you do, do remember about ligomon leguminous sorry uh, uh, legume ligomonas sorry so leguminous plants are there they have nodules in their roots who fixes nitrogen from the air there are certain plants uh, i don't uh, i am remembering my uh, the name in my bengali uh, mother tongue which is called as the kolostotri uh, i don't i am not remembering the english term presently so what this plant do is actually uh, is as a certain a uh, folding structure so if some, some insect is insect sits on 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 the mouth then it it is actually closes so this way uh, the insects actually is trapped inside and it dies and from that body actually they get the nitrogen they are actually heterotrophic uh, plants and the last option is do can be used as a measure to control nitrification and denitrification process so whether do dissolve oxygen it is whether it is an indicator of the nitrification and denitrification process or not okay okay both of you have answered a c and d prashant is telling and uh, also is saying a and c we'll see so both of you are correct and uh, d option d is also correct also not that do can be used as a measure to control nitrification and denitrification processes why because you see there is in air there is 79% oxygen and 21% uh, 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen and there are mass transfer uh, taking place between uh, water and the uh, atmosphere or may, maybe the legumes of the leguminous soriaceous plants and and the air there is constant mass transfer is taking place during fixation of nitrogen right so if if there is a change in the percentage of the oxygen it will act as a indication of the uh, nitri nitrogen percentage uh, also that is coming out of the air or that is uh, the of the air that is dissolved in the water also so that's why it can be used as a measure to control the nitrification and denitrification process and the other two options i think both of you have understood a and c okay <clears throat> but the option b that is for the heterotrophs it is not correct lesser lesser distance and time than heterotrophs is not correct okay because nitrate fires heterotrophs actually they will just the insect will be, get trapped inside it will take time for it to degrade then they uh, the plant will get nitrogen from it but uh, the nitrate fires 
they actually is faster their retention time is not slower than neurons okay heterotrophic process is basically takes time they immediately don't open the lid <coughs> okay option a actually i mean if the option a is correct option d is also like <coughs> okay option c actually you have to think okay now next question is select the correct option regarding advantages of a tickling filter it is also an msq multiple set question a tickling filter can withstand shock loadings option b nitrogen removal efficiency is very high option c there is no odor and fly uh, nuisance and option d is simpler operations which are the correct options regarding tickling filter regarding advantage of tickling filter so all are advantages basically simple operations no odor and fly nitrogen removal efficiency is very high Hmm. shock loading it can withstand all are all are basically advantages but whether if someone some disadvantage was that you can really omit that but there is no there is none all are the advantages so whether they are associated with trickling filter or not that you have to think as far as i remember both, both of you have answered okay only portion has answered a and d portion has answered uh, shock loading is an advantage simple operation is not uh, as far as i remember the order and fly nuisance that they are talking about it is not an advantage of tickling filter why because you see tickling filter is a again it, it is an attached growth process so they are they are the, the bed is there within that bed the filter of uh, the, the layer of the filter of of that uh, uh, microbes is there so it's is a stagnant position so the, the order and fly that that will occur in, in case of of the tickling filter so it, it is it is not an advantage it is never happen in tickling filter it will, the order will come and fly may come may or may not depending on the uh, maintenance but uh, it, it is not a exclusive advantage of tm so option c will not be the answer that i can say now we'll see whether you have answered it correctly or not a and d okay so yes it is the correct one <clears throat> because tickling filter has nothing to do with nitrogen removal or even if the nitrogen bacteria are there so it's a, it is not designed to remove that one so that's why option a and d is correct it is simple operation and it can withstand shock loads because it is a stagnant and robust in nature the structure is uh, well formed okay so now uh, next msq what uh, is or are the primary reasons for sludge bulking in water treatment plants sludge bulking we already discussed earlier option a is excessive growth of filamentous bacteria option b is inadequate mixing of waste water and sludge option c is high organic load and uh, low ml vss in the aeration tank and option d is insufficient aeration in the treatment process this both of you should answer this is uh, we we talked about sludge bulking twice today was on this training option a and c or so now you should also answer this you have answered no ali <laughs> ali world look what are the primary reasons for sludge bulking the other are not <coughs> see okay s e n d you are talking about s e n d see a and c are correct only you see the answer so a and c are correct see the i i think b also you have understood in educating some waste water and sludge has nothing to do with sludge bulking why option d is also not uh, important from sludge bulking point of view because see again i i told that aeration has no effect on the total population of the bacteria what it is doing 
it is actually helping a particular bacteria for the uh, what is called uh, aeration is helping a particular bacteria for the aerobic degradation of micropolitans. Okay. So now, if let's say <coughs> aeration, you are not giving aeration. So let's say aeration is not sufficient. Okay. So aeration, it will help in the growth. So that's why the MLSS or MLVSS content within the total uh, solids will increase. Right. So that's why the difference will get decreased. Sludge bulking will reduce. That is okay. But if the NAP aeration is insufficient, not sufficient, what will happen at the time? See, there is a certain particular amount of MLSS or MLVSS that is present within the total solid. Fine. If let's say the aeration is insufficient, what will happen? The microbes that is already present, they will not grow in them. But there is no reason that the difference between the total solids and the accumulated solids will increase. No. The total amount of the solids and total amount of the bacteria that is already present in the uh, already present in the what is called uh, wastewater stream, stream that will remain the same. Sludge bulking is the process when the difference gets increased. So the increase thing when the increase occurs, increase occurs when the uh, what is called the uh, kinds of uh, different types of uh, bacteria uh, as as here, here it is said as filamentous bacteria or the dead bacteria is increased so they are consuming foods they are growing in numbers and they are also dying their dying rate is also very high so then you will see the bulking here if the aeration is inefficient they will not grow in the first place so the dying is at a, at a later stage it, 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 the question of dying is not come so whatever the present at the inlet flow rate they will remain the same throughout so that's why such bulking will not occur okay so that's why it's a bit, it will be a bit confusing option, but I hope you, you, you got the idea. The bulking means the dead bacteria is increasing. So that's why the difference between the total and the activated is increasing. But here in the process, the difference will remain the same. It will not increase, not decrease. That's why such bulking is not caused by the aeration in the treatment process. Okay, I hope this is clear. So the other options I hope all okay so uh, okay so next uh, next question what is or are the main purpose of using chloramines in water treatment it is also an msq multiple select question so option a is to remove iron and manganese option b is to remove uh, to provide long lasting residual disinfectant option c is to remove phosphorus and option d is to remove sulfur so sulfur, iron, manganese, phosphorus. So are any one of them or is any one of them removed by the chloramines or not? If they are removed, they, 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 who, which one of them is removed? That, that will be uh, the option and also whether option B is correct to provide long lasting residuals. So you, you can see chlorine, it is a chlorine related compound. So I think option B will be correct only, I think. Because this thing comes, chlorine comes into the picture whenever there is you need residual uh, disinfectant to present in your wastewater. To present in your wastewater. Sorry, long lasting. This is true. Option B, both of you are telling to be true, and none of the other options are true, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Another option is there. To remove bacteria and viruses. So, do you think this one is true? <clears throat> what do you think? Option E. I think uh, you have answered it correctly because ferrum, manganese, phosphorus, and sulfur, uh, I mean, they are not removed uh, with chloramines, I think. Yes. So, it is in just a chemical process. Phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus can be chemically present, but uh, I think you are correct here. 
<coughs> they are not present by chloramines but whether option e is correct here or not okay you are not responding that means you don't think option e is a correct answer and i think you are correct so only option b is the correct answer so bacteria and viruses are <coughs> removed by not chloramines by direct chlorination okay chloramines <coughs> I mean, the the purpose of using chloramines is only to provide long-lasting residual disinfectant. Okay. Okay. Now, now the Chick's law problem, as Prashant was asking initially, we will solve couple of problems based on that. Hmm. So, if you plot n by n naught with respect to time then you will see an exponential kind of decay so asymptotic uh, nature so after certain time the rate of decay will decrease okay if it is something like this that means exponential decay. if something like this that means after certain time the rate of decay is also getting decreased so it is actually it is the graphical representation of the chick's law what chick is saying he's saying the curve you are seeing it suggested the existence of a logarithm relation between two variables. What are the variables? Time on the one hand and number of the surviving bacteria on the other hand. Okay. The, in fact, the curves appear to be very sim similar, uh, similar uh, form to that expressing the course of the so-called unimolecular reaction and the equation. So, whenever the Chick's law will be applicable, you, you will be told that, see, apply, uh, apply Chick's law here. And you will apply what? You will apply, you remember that Chick's law follows first order, uh, first order reaction way. That means minus dc by dt, the rate of decrease of whatever concentration is there, be it a chlorine or be it a uh, bacteria, whichever follows Chick's law, it is a first order kinetics. That means equals to k into c, c to the power 1 will be there, c to the power not 0, not 2, 3, 4. Okay, it's a first order kinetics. Then, if you integrate it, uh, then what will happen? C comes at the left hand side, dt comes at the right hand side. After integrating, it becomes kt and it becomes minus, L, minus of ln c. If you integrate, if you consider at time t1, the concentration is c1, and at time t2, the concentration is c2. Then, because of the minus sign, it will flip. Uh, instead of log c2 by c1, it will become log c1 by c2. And the right hand side, it will become k into t2 minus t1. That t2 minus t1 will come in the left hand side. This is the uh, integration result. Okay. If uh, if you if you express the c1 and c2 in terms of the reacting substances uh, of the surviving bacteria, just in our case, it is n by n naught. Then simply c1 by c2 will be replaced by n, n1 by a2 and if chick's law problem is given to you then the values of k the values of i mean if there is a one equation so there will be one and the other all the other values will be given to the question where in, in the last equation n1 and n2 are the number of bacteria surviving after times t2 and t1 respectively generally what happens in the in our graph n0 is the t0 that means you are starting time okay and n n is the at at time t like that way. okay so i hope chicks law you are able to understand nothing fancy it is just a first order reaction kinetics chicks law means first order reaction kinetics nothing else okay <clears throat> just that just, just the way i i i actually explained you the uh, order of the reactions, how how they are integrated, and what is their nature in different types of reactors, batch reactor, uh, plug flow reactor, CSTR, uh, continuous start tank reactor, or MFR sometimes it is called mixed flow reactor. So what are their characteristics in those cases? Right, we have already discussed. So that first order term you just take for Chick's law. That's all nothing fancy so then we will solve a problem based on the chick's law so
so only uh, so the uh, first problem is a disinfectant sorry a disinfectant solution is used to inactivate a certain microorganisms with an initial concentration so here microorganism concentration is given and they are telling that uh, microorganism concentration so uh, as the microorganism concentration is given it will follow Chick's law initial concentration is 2.5 into the power 7 cfu per ml cfu means coordinate forming unit per ml the inactivation rate constant k value is given determined to be 0 0.03 per hour hmm. see the per hour thing indicates the first order uh, uh, first order consideration only because uh, i mean if you, if you just look at the unit of the k value if it, it is separate separate order if it is zero order if it is second order then the k values uniquely will be different that's all so you have to calculate how long does it take to reduce the microorganisms concentration down to 0.5 into the power 5 coronary forming unit per m that means at time t equals to t0 time t equals to zero n0 is given uh, or c0 is given and at time t uh, n value or c2 value is given to you okay and also k value is given to you just put in the formula and calculate tell me the answer for the t time or the time interval t2 minus t2 that is t2 minus t1 that you have to calculate based on the chicks law some problem is not lost what problem is time is not up it is still six minutes left <coughs> So you have to calculate an answer. <laughs> no next class, this class only. Simple problem, it is nothing else. Just remember the formula, put the value in the formula and you calculate. <laughs> yes, sorry. I mean, calculator is required because there is exponential term thing. So you may have to take ln both sides. Uh, depends. Depends on the data given. <coughs> Please calculate. It will be the answer. <coughs> I will wait for one more minute. Take your calculator, or you may use your mobile. Calculator also, or you may calculate in laptop also. And the exponential term, the logarithmic, if you have to take log, then that values will come. Formula do you remember or should I show you again? So this is the formula for Chick's law. This is the formula minus dc by dd equals to k equals dc. Uh, after integration, it, it takes the form of this. Here t is 0, t2 minus t1, you, this value you take t. c1, c2 is given, k is given. Just take the ratio of the two. It is not log basically, it is long. Ln and it's log base e. Uh, I mean, I mean the concept actually is very confusing because people continue to write log here. Ln means log base e. If there is no ln or no base e, then the log means base 10. But what we usually do, we actually log uh, by, by 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 the meaning log of only we actually take ln. So this thing is a bit confusing. So here it is, though it is written as log, it is basically ln. That is the base E is there, log base E. Okay. But later we will solve a problem, but we will see that there is log, but it is, I mean, base 10. It is not base E. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. We are not solving. I don't know what. It's a very easy problem. So now we will uh, solve this problem. So the answer can be calculated 
using the integrated version of the Chick's law equation. So the, the DC by DT, that is your not uh, differential version. You are using the integrated version. Uh, the integrated version means n equals to n naught into e to the power minus k. Simple. You just see this one. Why e is coming? Because it is log base e, as I told earlier. So this t2 minus t1 is take it as t, so it becomes kt. And base e means what? e to the power minus kt. It means c2 by c1. If it is c1 by c2, then e to the power kt. But if it is c2 by c1, then it is e to the power minus kt. Because minus value flips the uh, whatever is within bracket under log. So this n is following forming unit per ml. It is the number of microorganisms at a given time t equals to 0.5 into raise of 5. n naught. It is again column forming unit per ml. It is the initial number of microorganisms. The value is given again in the question as 2.5 into raise of 7. Now k value is given in the question per hour. That means first order. It is an inactivated rate constant. It is given as 0 0.03. Okay, these, these are all the units. These are all the values given. We just put inside the formula and the solution is something like this. So 0 0.5 into the power 5, eh, sorry, eh, sorry, equals to 2.5 into the power 7 into e to the power minus 0 0.03 because it is minus kt into t. Okay. If this is this side and this is that side, then it will be plus. That's what you have to remember. N, n by n naught is e to the minus kt. N naught by n, it is e to the power kt. So any one formula you can use, but you have to remember the sign convention. Otherwise, it will be wrong. Okay. So just you divide the 0 0.5 with this two. Um, what to what? You, you take e to the power this in this side. So it will be e to the power uh, minus 0, e to the power t into 0 0.03. In this side, and in right hand side, it will be 2.5 into the power 7 by 0 0.5 into the power 5. So 100 into 25 by 5, that means 500. You take ln 500 and divide it with 0 0.03. So the t value will come something like this 207.15 hours. Any problem in understanding this? this? <coughs> Did you understand? You don't understand uh, it is it is all you, you know right if you take ln in both sides the ln of e becomes one so this this is this is a plus two level knowledge so if you had mathematics in your plus two level you, you will know that otherwise you can just put ln e in your calculator it will give you value as one so can i buy five more minutes because one last problem is left so where uh, I'll show, let's see, the log concept is there. So log means basically 10 ohm, though in most of the cases, by means of log, they take log E, but it is not the correct notation. It should be written as ln. But in most of the books, they actually follow the wrong way of writing it. But uh, you'll see in, the, in our uh, next problem, this is the last problem that we will solve. We'll see it. I will take five more minutes of you. So you will see that they are the log basically means log base 10 of not uh, ln. Okay. So we'll solve one more problem. So it is based on the pH. Okay. The pH of a solution after adding an acid is 4.8. So neutral pH is 7. It can vary from 1 to 14. If you add acid, it will be more, less than 7. If you add base or alkali, it will be more than 7. Okay. So less than 7, it is 4.8. If you, uh, you have added an acid, acids generalized formula is written like this way. A is a particular group. H is an H plus ion. So it is, uh, I mean, it can donate one, one hydrogen plus ion. Hydrogen plus ion means what? Proton. Proton has, uh, I mean, uh, hydrogen has what? Hydrogen has one... <coughs> proton at its nucleus and one electron at its surroundings. So if it, if it has got uh, one neutron also, then it will be deuterium. If it has got 
two neutrons along with one proton then the mass number is three it is called as tritium but it is a simple hydrogen so that's why hydrogen plus ion that means hydrogen ion devoid of electron means proton okay so now if the concentration of the deprotonated form why it is sold because the hydrogen plus ion which is the proton it is removed only the a minus is remaining a, a is a particular group so it is given as 10 to the power minus 3.2 m means molar then you have to estimate the total concentration of the acid h a which is written as the third bracket of h a at equilibrium in micromolar unit uh, and the pk value pka this value is required for the ph calculation problems it is given as 3.86 so this is the last problem uh, I, I, I request you to both of you to bear with me so do you know the formula for calculation of ph if you know then i will wait for you to calculate if you don't know i will just go on with the solution <coughs> Do you know or not? Don't know. Let's comment or I'll move on with the solution. This is the last problem. Only two minutes it will require to solve. Okay, you know. Okay, then I'll wait for you to calculate. Please calculate and technique tell me the answer in micro motor. Whatever mole it will come. Hmm. If it has got it into 10 to the power minus 6 with it, then it is 1 micromole. If, if it is, uh, yes, like that. Right? If it has got a 10 to the power minus 5 with it, then what will happen? Then you have to multiply with 10 and divide by 10, like that. Right? Yes. And then Take the multiplied value as as the divided by 10 it will add to 10 to the minus 6 so it will be 1 micro so multiply 10 it will give you the micromolar that's all if you ph value if you, you say formula is p the term p means minus log ph means minus log of concentration of h plus n okay and here the log means log base 10 not ln not e log base e it does not mean so it's an exceptional case in all of the books you will see they are assuming log as log base e only but it is an incorrect way to denote it is basically ln not log logarithm it is not logarithm i don't know the full form of ln but it is a wrong wrong way of denotion but still book most of the books follow this wrong way. It is not, it is wrong. Whatever, whatever is there in this problem, base 10, that is the correct one. Please tell me the answer, otherwise I'll, it's 95 almost. I think I should move with the solution. Also now, I think you don't know the form, right? Okay. So we'll uh, move on. Okay, one more minute. I know, I can wait for you to calculate, otherwise I'll do the solution. Okay, okay, this time is almost up. So I'll move with the solution. So the data given, all the data are required, so all are useful. The concentration of deprotonated form is given as 10 to the minus 3.2 molar. pH value is given as, uh, pH means minus log of concentration of H is given as uh, 4.8. The pK, it is a constant which is used in the formula for pH calculation of pH value it is given as 3.86 what is the formula the solution is the following the formula is called as the uh, henderson hassel balch equation hhe you remember in short form okay the formula is something like this pH equals to this pH equals to pKa plus log of a plus uh, sorry a minus divided by that is the d power form divided by concentration of the acid h is the short form of the acid okay h plus is the acid uh, proton that the acid can donate and a, a minus is the uh, deprotonated form of the acid together it's this is concentration of the acid okay 
Actually, it is something like this PK minus of log base 10 into HA divided by A minus. So they have just flipped it and made it positive. Okay, that is the actual formula. Basically. Okay. So now the pH value is given as 4.8, pK value is given as 3.86 plus log base 10. You take the A minus value, which is given as 10 to the power minus 3.2 divided by this one. You have to calculate the concentration of acid. This formula, unfortunately, you have to remember. There is no way. I mean, the derivation way is there, but you will not get that much time to derive this formula in examination. Okay. So whenever uh, there is a certain thing that I have to tell my students, you have to remember. Then I, I personally don't like. But what can I, can I do? There are certain things you have to remember. You cannot do anything about that. Okay. So you take this 3.86 in the left hand side. So 4.8 minus 3.86, it became 0 0.94. And log value is uh, same. Then the concentration of this age, how, how it is coming. So you are you are taking, you see. 10 to the log base 10 is there, right? So it is not e to the power 0 0.94, it is 10 to the power 0 0.94 equals to whatever they are in, in the inside bracket. I hope you know the log thing. Log thing you have studied in your plus two level, I think. So you, you understand these things. So 10 to the power 0 0.94 equals to 10 to the minus 3.2 divided by h. That means h equals to 10 to the power 94 comes at the right hand side in the denominator. Okay. So it becomes 10 to the power minus 3.2 minus 0 0.9. That means 10 to the power minus of 3.2 plus 0 0.94. Okay. That means what? That means uh, 4.14. 10 to the power minus 4.14, which is nothing but 7.24436 into the power minus 5 molar. That means in micromoles, you just divide with 10, multiply with 10. Divided 10 becomes 10 to the minus 6, so it becomes micromole. And multiply means 72.44 is the answer. Okay, so hope it is clear to you. Thank you for your attention. Any doubt you can ask. Otherwise, we can close this session. We'll meet. Uh, in the next class on 12th March. Okay, so bye bye. Good night. I end the session.